Medicine. So Dr. Alia then graduated from India in 2018, came to the UK shortly after. She did really well to, to get a plastics themed uh, course surgical job in Wales Deanery. I think, is it Alia, you year two now or year three? Uh, finishing year one, starting. Okay, finishing so year one. Wow, okay. it feels like a long time since you did the talk. But obviously not that long. And also she's founder and president of the Surgical Society of International Doctors. I'm sure she'll talk about that a little bit uh, in her talk. But thank you so much for coming on board again, Alia, on a Saturday. And I'm sure you're going to inspire these guys into doing surgery. Okay, guys, so you should see something on your screen right now. Have you considered a career in surgery, yes or no? Wow, that's the that's the biggest of the day so far. So 82% oh, wow. uh, Ali have considered doing surgery. That's that's huge. Like no no that's special that kind of number. Yeah. Um, and around 20% are, are are not of the surgical background type. So let's like come and uh, introduce me. My name is Alia. I am uh, currently a surgical trainee in Wales in plastic team uh, program. And um, I did my MBBS from India and I've recently cleared my MRCS as well. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about surgery in the UK. I will shortly talk about my experience of getting from India to the UK and um, then move on to telling you about what would be the best way for you to uh, think about doing surgery in the UK. Um, so I can, uh, I'm assuming most of our audience uh, are back in their own countries trying to come to the UK or there may be some people who are already working in UK wanting to get into training so something might be repetitive or too basic for you but I would like to aim this talk at everybody from medical school in your own country to people over who are over here. Um, so um, so that's the, the picture on the left is where I grew up, um, that's uh, Mumbai. And then I went to Pune to study and that's my medical school in, uh, on the right. And um, I sort of knew I wanted to do surgery when I was in my second year of medical school, but I didn't know where exactly. Initially it was, the plan was to stay in India, but then people started talking about USMLE and CLAD and um, I was just all very confusing and I didn't know what to do. Um, but I think PLAB just sort of fell on my laps and I met somebody, I met a friend who said, you know, you should give this exam and I gave it and I was like, here and um, it just happened. So uh, if you are confused about USMLE versus UK, hopefully you'll understand something about the surgical program in the UK from the stock. Uh, so you can sort of weigh it up with the USMLE option or comparing it to PG in India as well. Now, Everyone talks about surgery being very competitive. And when I was in India, people were like, you know what, you can get medicine, you can get pediatrics or psychiatry, but you may, you'll not get into surgery. It's too competitive. You know, you, you're an international doctor and um, you don't have the things that they need. Uh, and this is exactly what I had when I came to the UK. Um, didn't, I hadn't done any exams. I didn't have any publication. I had one case presentation and um, one local leadership role and didn't know what audit was. And I clearly did not know that teaching is valuable to, towards your portfolio. And well, I went from there. I basically did not know much about the system at the time. There weren't that many, um, that many online resources or people like Aman and Pooja are doing this great work of telling everybody about how the training system works. So there wasn't that much information, I think, three years ago. Um, and that was 2018 when I came, but I sort of winged it and um, just gave the exam. I was just took one step at a time, like which I think is a really good way to go. Just give PLAB one, clear PLAB one, and then we'll deal with the next. PLAB two, I gave in March 2019. And then I was like, you know, I'll get a job in the UK and then see whether I can get into training or not. Like there's no reason to, even if you are starting somewhere where you don't have a lot, don't be disheartened or don't be, you know, um, demotivated by the fact that you will not get in. It's um, if you if you know the game and if you know what you need, you will, you will. Uh, and if you train and you put in your hard work, you should be able to be eligible to be to be you know in the competition in that race um so i did plans in 2018 i did a non-training job for a year in general surgery followed by teaching and itu so a total of one and a half year before i got into training 
And I got into co-training last year, August. I'm almost finishing it now. I've cleared my MRCS exams and um, cleared the first year as well. And very excited to move into the second year. Um, so it is from from my experience. It is what I like to say. What you can take back from my story is that I did, I start from not having a lot, and I did get what I wanted. So if you are in a place where you don't have a lot on your CV, start now, and hopefully by the time you do apply in in later on in a year's time or so, you will have those things on your on your portfolio. And that's the reason for this talk that you understand where you what you need to do right now. So a little bit about the training structure. I'm sure you would have understood by the other talks how it works, but in the UK, they do medical school five, six years, and then they do some, something called as a foundation training for two years, which is equal in F1 is equal into the internship that we do back in our country. And then they do two years of core training. So core surgical training and followed by you apply again for a registrar training. And that starts, from ST3 to ST8. So if you see from CT1, it's the numbers, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's eight years of training total, and you need to apply twice. You need to apply first at the starting of core training, and then you apply again at the starting of ST3. And um, eventually you become a consultant. Now, it may seem like a really long time, but it is, if you compare it to something like in India, where you do three years of post-graduation, then you do two years of super specialization, and then you do your SR ship, and, and then you work as a registrar for a bit before you actually work independently as a consultant. So it sort of is a similar timeline, and you're basically working during this whole time. You're not, you're not paying fees for, for anything. You're getting paid. So you're working in hospital, getting paid, and getting the training alongside that. Um, the advantages for surgery in the UK, according to me, in my opinion, is we practice evidence-based medicine. So everything is, um, everyone practices similar, follow the same guidelines all over the country. There's a standard, standardized uh, guidelines that we follow. And the techno like there's uh, advanced technology, there's robotics coming up in urology and um, uh, the approach to the patient is very holistic and the training as well is very standardized. You have a minimum number of requirements that you need to achieve in surgery. So every, at the end of this year, for instance, I need to have had 200 cases on my logbook of which I should have done at least 30% myself. So it's, there is no, no bias. No, uh, your training doesn't depend upon your... Uh, not. It of course depends on the consultant you're working under, but doesn't completely. He, it's they're they're required to train you according to what what the standard standard standards are kept. So that way everyone will get similar training, which is really really nice. And you have excellent research opportunities if that's what you're interested in as well. Um, Another really good thing about the UK is that exams are a test of competence. They're not a test of excellence. So you don't need to be ranking. You don't need to have rank one, rank two, or you need to be in the top 100. All you need to do is pass. And you need to be competent enough. And that's, the, that's not only in exams. That's how they look at training in every way. You need to be, everyone needs to be competent. And if you pass the level of competence, then that's okay. So um, that's really nice. Another good thing about um, training in the UK. Um, and also it teaches you to be an all-rounder, really. It teaches you to be a good communicator and a teacher and a leader and a mentor. And um, it tests your uh, resilience and patience. And um, it teaches you to be a better human as well, I would say. Like, I feel I've grown so much in the last three years. Uh, it's incredible. And you have lots of opportunities after you finish your training as and you become a consultant. You uh, can work in the NHS. You can have do humanitarian work. You can go into education if that's what you're passionate about or go into research um, or management. So uh, my typical week, um, 
keeps changing to be honest like it depends on what rotation i'm on and uh, how my rota looks like but on an average any surgical sho junior level uh, doctors week involves going to theater like you have specific uh, assigned theater days or where you may go to an elective theater or you may go to an emergency theater then you're there are days where you do on calls and they're usually 12 and a half hour shifts so you start at 8 and finish at 8 30 or you do night shifts where you start at 8 and finish 8 p.m and finish in the morning at 8 a.m and then there are days where you go to the clinic and you um, look at ward patients and deal with ward patients sometimes you get study days and research days as well um, in the mix of all of that um so uh god so um we start talking i'd like to talk about the polio which is, um was the most important thing that we need to be working on right for is get into uh, what is that you're doing on right the training um so i'll take you through if you post the link on the chat group where you can actually access the latest specific uh, specifications of the portfolio as well and um the website that you can find this on is uh oral so www.oral.nhs.uk um uh, like i'd like to say nothing is impossible if you really really want something you can always achieve it um, now, CSC application has two sections. It has a portfolio and interview. So first, you, you have to submit your portfolio. They, they give you a score. And then if you cross the, um, the eligibility scoring, uh, if you get, mid, get above the minimum score required for that year, then you're called for an interview. And then um, you give the interview for which you get scores as well. So 25% of your rank of your final score depends on portfolio and 75% depends on your interview. And then the total rank, uh, total score will give you a rank, and then based on that you can apply uh, uh, for posts. So although it's only 25% portfolio, it is the one that decides whether you are called for an interview or not. So it's really important, and that as an international doctor, that is somewhere we lack because our system doesn't really work according to what they want, but it can if you if you work in the right ways, you can make your portfolio. Um, uh similar to what the uk uh system wants so things that i wish i knew before were portfolio what is evidence what is research what like what is audits and how to accumulate evidence for teaching sorry i'm rushing through but there's a lot of slides to get through um so the portfolio score the uh, total portfolio score is 72 so um I'll be taking you through different sections. So you, it'd be really nice if you can actually get a piece of paper and a pen. And while we're going through the slides, you can sort of score yourself uh, in each section and then you can add it up and see where you stand. And that's what I did. So before, before you start doing something, you need to know where you are right now, where do you stand and what, so that you can sort of see what you can do to achieve higher scores. So if you score yourself and where you stand, from zero to 72 on that. And then you can sort of see how much you need to work um, to achieve an eligible score. And this score, the eligible score keeps changing every year. It depends on, it's an average. So it depends on how many people apply, it depends what everyone's score is that year. So normally it ranges from 47 to 55. Uh, and if you've got above that, um, you you'd be called for an interview but don't quote me on that it keeps changing every and they don't release that score either so it's divided into different sections um, um so first is commitment to specialty so in this they want to see how committed are you to surgery so uh so again the scoring system changes every year depending on where you are if you're still in medical school and going to apply five years later then don't really get stuck on to the number of scores, but just get a gist of the things that they want and work towards those because every year they keep changing the scores and they keep changing little bits here and there. But what they are overall looking for is exams. Have you given your exams? If you give your part A exam, for instance, you, you get four points. And if you don't get four points, um, have you done, have you attended and then you don't get those four points? surgical courses have you got any surgical experience and conferences and electives and day studies 
So what you need to do is in each of these sections, you need to collect evidence of everything that you do. So with courses, every time you attend a course, get a certificate and keep it handy. Um, surgical experience is how many theater cases have you attended? And you need to have a logbook for this. Um, if you're in the UK, then you use e-logbook. Uh, if you've got a GMC number, then you can use the e-logbook. But if you've not, then you can just sort of make an Excel sheet and put in the, um, put in the case, the date, don't put in any identifiable uh, patient data, but just you can put in the hospital number of the patient, your the case, and what did you do? Did you assist? Did you perform the surgery? And if you if you have a logbook like a, a, a data of all the cases that you've attended, what they need is on, is not that much. Is only 40 cases. If you have sorry more than 30 cases, then you get the maximum number of points. Um, and then conferences, collect conference certificates and experience. So if you've got an elective or a taster, this is something which is different, which, which is more focused for UK trainees where they do, after their med school, they go and do an elective in a different hospital from where they're working for four weeks or so and get some surgical experience. So, or you can get a taster week when you do come to the UK and you start your first, say, non-training job, uh, you can apply for a taster week in a different department. It's fairly easy to get. So if you don't have an elective, that is fine. But the most important thing is collect evidence of everything. Put it in one place so you have it when, when you're applying. Now, the second section is degrees. Um, this is a section that I scored zero on. So, and this is a section most international doctors would probably not score that much because we... Um, is, unless, you, if you, unless you're doing a... Uh, you're coming after your postgrad, but if you're coming straight up to MBBS, we don't have a culture of doing an additional degree like bachelor's, BSc and stuff, which is what UK trainees do. But it is a lot of effort for very little points, if you see. For a PhD, you've got four points, whereas if you go back to the last slide, you can get four points by just attending four courses. So um, if you don't have anything in this, don't get too stuck on it, on it. Most people don't have a lot of scores on this one and it's fine to score zero on this section. Then prizes. Now they will, there's a separate section for prizes where you, you can get, um, depending on whether it's a national, local, regional prize, you get different scores. So collect that certificate if you've got any prize, keep it safe. Um, try to participate in various uh, competitions like poster presentations and uh, oral presentations, essays, um, debates, anything that's related to medicine. And if you want a prize, um, it, it, it'll be counted. And if you don't have a prize yet, if you participate, your chances of winning something will increase. So start, start attending conferences, start attending those um, uh, competitions. I think essay writing is quite uh, quite a common one and easy one to get as well. There's not that many people who participate. So the chances of you getting a prize is a bit higher. Then audit. Um, if you don't know what, what an audit is, I think it's a too long a topic to get into in this uh, talk, but go and re if you don't know what, what an audit is, go and read about it, type audits, NHS, and uh, you'll, you'll have a lot of information out there on the internet. And um, it's difficult to do an audit while you're not in the UK because the system doesn't exist in other countries more so. Um, but if you don't have it don't worry about it you can come to the uk and work on getting an audit go through go through each section so they want you to be leading to have a leading role in all the aspects of the audit and present it as well at a regional or a local meeting and that will give you the maximum points so um if you don't have it don't worry you when you come to the uk do your first job you can do an audit that time but if it is possible and you're in your country and you think it's possible to do an audit try and start getting and uh, getting on doing one and getting an experience of doing one as well. And what evidence do you need for this is just a letter from a consultant sta stating that you've done this audit, you've led it, you've completed the cycle and you've presented it as well. And you can put in your certificate of presentation as well as evidence. Um, the next section is teaching. Now, um, we all do teaching every job i think like every day on a ward round if you've got a junior 
you you every day in our jobs i think like if, when you're talking about a case that is informal teaching we do formal teaching as well where you teach uh, take lectures and small group teachings and you know workshops um so i think what what's difficult is though to prove that you're doing this teaching so you need to have that evidence and that evidence can be collected in the form of feedbacks so you can just have a feedback form filled in every time you do teaching and you've got them collected that is evidence and also if you're doing formal teaching you you might have certificate now going beyond that what they want is for you to design and organize something that would be a, that's a teaching program at a regional level um and contribute towards teaching regularly over the year which doesn't need to have related to this program which could be just workshops or you know bedside teaching and have feedback so um now designing a teaching at a regional level the easiest way of doing that is doing something virtually nowadays everything is possible virtually and it's really uh, is compared not really but comparatively easier to organize something uh, on zoom for instance and um, you know you can you can invite people or participants from different parts uh, the different parts of uh, where you live and that becomes a regional teaching and um the evidence would be for that is getting a letter from your supervisor or a consultant stating that you've done this teaching and you have designed it you've organized it you've led it and um you don't necessarily need to be if it's a teaching program you don't necessarily need to be um teaching every session you can have other speakers but it's about organizing and designing this program where you have different talks and different speakers coming on different days and talking about something um but if you don't want to go for the top scoring thing even if you have uh, just done regular teaching um bedside teaching or every day that you teach at work just get feedback form filled in from your supervisor uh, from your attendees and that counts uh, that give you four points as well um then the next section is on training in teaching so um again this is another section which is a lot of effort for very little points so if you don't have this don't be disheartened um don't just do it for the points if you are um for instance i have done a pg cert in med ed and i got points for that but the reason i did it is because i really like medical education and i was passionate about that and i wanted to get a degree in that but if you're not passionate about it if you don't think you can you you know you think you don't want to go through a full year of doing pg like a course in medical education then i think i think it's not worth doing it just for three points because you can attend various one day two day courses and still get two points um so uh, so yeah so masters in pg cert is just doing a year or two year long course whereas uh the you can get two points for attending a five day course now it doesn't necessarily need to be have uh it doesn't necessarily need to be a five day course which is like a one course which is five days long it can be three courses that you've done you've done one course for two days you've done another course for another two days and then you've done another course for one day and you can club it up and say that you've got at least five days of training just what you need is certificates from all of these things um and there's lots of there's lots of opportunities out there you can if you google tra uh, training in teaching uk or you try medical education courses there's lots of stuff online um there's um, lots of in person courses as well um so you should be able to find that out the next um uh, the next session uh, section is on presentations so this accounts for original present uh, oral presentations and poster presentations and then they break it down depending on whether it's national regional or local the maximum points is for an oral presentation at a national or international meeting so anything that you have like if you if you're doing an audit you can present it if you if you've got some research you can present it if you've got an interesting case maybe you can present that as well so start participating i think the 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 main thing is it, you just there's so many so many opportunities out there you just need to start grabbing them you need to start submitting abstracts to conferences and you know all the presentations i agree are difficult to get but poster presentations you can get 5 points for two posters at a national or international meeting and it's really it, comparatively if you submit an abstract and it's not got any gross mistakes and 
it's a decent uh, project, then it should get accepted for poster presentations. If you think, if you see that you're not getting any posters, then maybe start applying for smaller, smaller uh, conferences, or conferences with trainees like ACID, for instance, they're really good at accepting posters. Um, that'd be a good conference to apply for. Um, and then the next is publications. Again, uh, publications is um, something, research and publication is something that everyone's scared of. Even I am, even today, um, I struggle with getting research because I'm not very academic, but um, I think, again, this is another section that you don't, you shouldn't, at your level, shouldn't stress that much about. Um, if you have it, that's good. If you can work on it, that's even better. But if you don't, then that's fine. A lot of people don't have that many publications at that level. So, um, but they give you, but it is important that if you do have a publication or a project that you're submitting for publication, try to get it in a PubMed cited uh, uh, journal because that is what they want. They want a PubMed cited journal and um, that will give you um, the points. Um, Sorry, I think there's a mistake on the last one. The last column should be one and not four. So collaborative auto and two or more publication should be one. Um, so you can you can get you get more points if you're the first author, but you can get some points if you're a co-author. And even collaborative authorship, they've given two points for. So you can that's easier to get into. Um, and I think the last section is leadership. And uh, now you they divide it into national regional or local and any um you like any sort of leadership roles that you've held you need to get all you need to get is a letter or a certificate stating that you've done it and it needs to be at least over six months and you should be able to demonstrate that you've had you've made some change and you've done some work during this leadership role and um, that can be shown by the things that you've done. Like, have you done any, con have you organized something or if you've brought about any positive impact, if the consultant can write it up in a letter, um, then that should work. If you don't have any leadership uh, roles right now, start, um, if you follow various uh, societies, uh, they usually every year up, uh, open up uh, role opportunities for committee roles and you can start applying there within your college or you know if you're um, there's medical student association of india and all sorts of things uh, available just google and you should find something um also the scoring system like i said i've just copied it from uh, the one that's there on person specifications so there may be some mistakes on it but for the right uh, information you should refer to the oriel website which will give you the exact document that uh, the, um, they have published and um, i think the most important thing is consistency if you can see that there's a lot to do and a lot to achieve and it's all in different aspects it's not one so you need to start early wherever you are even if you're in first year medical school and you think you want to do surgery in the uk you can start today little by little but if you know what you need to do if you calculate what your score is and see what you can achieve be realistic about it you can't achieve everything you can't get 72 points out of 72 and there are some things that are that are, that are more difficult for some people than others but there are things that are easy to get and those are the things that you need to sort of try and get and work on it consistently like consistently like look back say okay one month and I've, am i standing at the same place or have i got some more points okay what can i do in the next two months to get some more points because things like research and presentations it takes months to achieve um so be consistent and start early and remember that your journey is unique you uh, everyone is starting at a different place, coming from different circumstances, and um, uh, you don't compare yourself with anybody uh, and just believe in yourself. Um, just a little bit about, uh, like, I feel like my journey was unique. I started from somewhere in Mumbai, that's where I live today on, in Swansea, and that's my hospital. I've made some amazing friends on the way and met some amazing colleagues and um you know done some presentations attended some conferences traveled a lot um and uh, i think you know you just have to believe in yourself and um and just be consistent <laughs> i think that's it from my side uh
hopefully I've not taken too long. Um, if you have any questions, you can just put it in the chat box maybe, and uh, you can connect uh, with me on Instagram. And also, um, if you want to follow the Surgical Society of International Doctors, that's the website and that's the Instagram. Okay, uh, thank you, yeah, I'm over to you. That was really good, thank you so much. Uh, Alia, just, just like last year, short, sharp, to the point, um, some key takeaways, but not just not just the factual, like you know, the, the inspirational stuff, the motivational stuff, keep things simple, but keep consistency, keep progressing, things will happen, you don't need to be a superstar to get into training, all these kind of things, these messages that you're putting across is, uh, is, is great, that, that, that's what I think resonates with a lot of doctors, and, and I think you know, just looking at the feedback, I think it's been really useful, people are saying it's a really good talk, there are lots of questions actually that have come through, um, we we might just looking at time. I we might just transfer them across to you if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of them are quite specific about people's individual circumstances rather than generic ones. Uh, one maybe one question to answer: Should the publication only be surgically themed? If you're thinking about publications. No, it doesn't have to be. Not at core surgical training level. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good question actually because. You know, it's publication and research demonstrates certain skills, doesn't it? Even if it's not really in the surgical field. But, um, but yeah, I guess you know that's the question that people might have, particularly if they've done publications already. But your advice on how to go about doing that kind of stuff was really helpful as well. So, um, Pooja, what do you think? Should we should we handle these across to Alia because there are some specific ones for what I can see. But generally, looking at the feedback, Alia, really, really good. And and like we said in the first half, um, Pooja, anything to add on? No, great talk, as you said. So thank you, Alia. Um, I've already sent the questions across. I know lots of you had um, questions for this talk. Um, also, Alia put up her Instagram handle, so please also contact her there.